Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. This evening we're reading a classic of philosophy, the Tao Te Ching, or the Tao and its characteristics, by Lao Tzu, translated by James Leggy. Let's begin. Part 1. The Tao that can be trodden is not the enduring and unchanging Tao. The name that can be named is not the enduring and unchanging name. Conceived of as having no name, it is the originator of heaven and earth. Conceived of as having a name, it is the mother of all things. Always without desire we must be found. If it's deep mystery we would sound. But if desire always within us be, its outer fringe is all that we shall see. Under these two aspects, it is really the same. But as development takes place, it receives the different names. Together, we call them the mystery. Where the mystery is the deepest is the gate of all that is subtle and wonderful. All in the world know the beauty of the beautiful. And in doing this, they have the idea of what ugliness is. They all know the skill of the skillful. And in doing this, they have the idea of what the want of skill is. So it is that existence and non-existence give birth the one to the idea of the other. That difficulty and ease produce the one, the idea of the other. That length and shortness fashion out the one, the figure of the other. That the ideas of height and lowness arise from the contrast of the one with the other. That the musical notes and tones become harmonious through their relation of one with another. And that being before and behind give the idea of one following another. Therefore, the sage manages affairs without doing anything and conveys his instructions without the use of speech. All things spring up, and there is not one which declines to show itself. They grow, and there is no claim made for their ownership. They go through their processes, and there is no expectation of a reward for the results. The work is accomplished, and there is no resting in it as an achievement. The work is done, but how no one can see. Tis this that makes the power not cease to be. Not to value and employ men of superior ability is the way to keep the people from rivalry among themselves. Not to prize articles which are difficult to procure is the way to keep them from becoming thieves. Not to show them what is likely to excite their desires is the way to keep their minds from disorder. Therefore the sage, in the exercise of his government, empties their minds, fills their bellies, weakens their wills, and strengthens their bones. He constantly tries to keep them without knowledge and without desire, and where there are those who have knowledge, to keep them from presuming to act on it. When there is this abstinence from action, Good order is universal. The Tao is like the emptiness of a vessel, and in our employment of it we must be on our guard against all fullness. How deep and unfathomable it is, as if it were the honored ancestor of all things. We should blunt our sharp points, and unravel the complications of things. We should attemper our brightness and bring ourselves into agreement with the obscurity of others. 
how pure and still the Tao is, as if it would ever so continue. I do not know whose son it is. It might appear to have been before God. Heaven and earth do not act from the impulse of any wish to be benevolent. They deal with all things as the dogs of grass are dealt with. The sages do not act from any wish to be benevolent. They deal with the people as the dogs of grass are dealt with. May not the space between heaven and earth be compared to a bellows? Tis emptied, yet it loses not its power. Tis moved again, and sends forth air the more. Much speech to swift exhaustion lead we see. Your inner being guard, and keep it free. The valley spirit dies not, I the same. The female mystery thus do we name. Its gate from which at first they issued forth is called the root from which grew heaven and earth. Long and unbroken does its power remain, used gently and without the touch of pain. Heaven is long enduring and earth continues long. The reason why heaven and earth are able to endure and continue thus long is because they do not live of or for themselves. This is how they are able to continue and endure. Therefore the sage puts his own person last, and yet it is found in the foremost place. He treats his person as if it were foreign to him, and yet that person is preserved. Is it not because he has no personal and private ends that therefore such ends are realized? The highest excellence is like that of water. The excellence of water appears in its benefiting all things, and in its occupying, without striving, to the contrary, the low place which all men dislike. Hence, its way is near to that of the Tao. The excellence of a residence is in the suitability of the place, that of the mind is in abysmal stillness. That of associations is in their being with the virtuous. That of government is in its securing good order. That of the conduct of affairs is in its ability. And that of the initiation of any movement is in its timeliness. And when one with the highest excellence does not wrangle about his low position, no one finds fault with him. It is better to leave a vessel unfilled than to attempt to carry it when it is full. If you keep feeling a point that has been sharpened, the point cannot long preserve its sharpness. When gold and jade fill the hall, their possessor cannot keep them safe. When wealth and honors lead to arrogancy, this brings its evil on itself. When the work is done and one's name is becoming distinguished, to withdraw into obscurity is the way of heaven. When the intelligent and animal souls are held together in one embrace, they can be kept from separating. When one gives undivided attention to the vital breath and brings it to the utmost degree of pliancy, he can become as a tender babe. When he has cleansed away the most mysterious sights of his imagination, he can become without a flaw. In loving the people and ruling the state, cannot he proceed without any purpose of action? In the opening and shutting of his gates of heaven, cannot he do so as a female bird? While his intelligence reaches in every direction, cannot he appear to be without knowledge? The Tao produces all things and nourishes them. It produces them and does not claim them as its own. It does all and yet does not boast of it. It presides over all, 
and yet does not control them. This is what is called the mysterious quality of the Tao. The thirty spokes unite in the one nave, but it is on the empty space for the axle that the use of the wheel depends. Clay is fashioned into vessels, but it is on their empty hollowness that their use depends. The door and windows are cut out from the walls to form an apartment, but it is on the empty space within that its use depends. Therefore, what has a positive existence serves for profitable adaptation, and what has not, that for actual usefulness. Colors five hues from the eyes their sight will take. Music's five notes the ears as deaf can make. The flavors five deprive the mouth of taste. The chariot course and the wild hunting waste make mad the mind, and objects rare and strange sought for men's conduct will to evil change. Therefore the sage seeks to satisfy the craving of the belly and not the insatiable longing of the eyes. He puts from him the latter, and prefers to seek the former. Favor and disgrace would seem equally to be feared. Honor and great calamity to be regarded as personal conditions of the same kind. What is meant by speaking thus of favor and disgrace? Disgrace is being in a low position after the enjoyment of favor, the getting that favor leads to the apprehension of losing it, and the losing it leads to the fear of still greater calamity. This is what is meant by saying that favor and disgrace would seem equally to be feared. And what is meant by saying that honor and great calamity are to be similarly regarded as personal conditions? What makes me liable to great calamity is my having the body which I call myself. If I had not the body, what great calamity could come to me? Therefore he who would administer the kingdom, honoring it as he honors his own person, may be employed to govern it. And he who would administer it with the love which he bears to his own person may be entrusted with it. We look at it, and we do not see it, and we name it the equable. We listen to it, and we do not hear it, and we name it the inaudible. We try to grasp it, and do not get hold of it, and we name it the subtle. With these three qualities, it cannot be made the subject of description, and hence we blend them together and obtain the one. Its upper part is not bright, and its lower part is not obscure. Ceaseless in its action, it yet cannot be named, and then it again returns and it becomes nothing. This is called the form of the formless, and the semblance of the invisible. This is called the fleeting and indeterminable. We meet it and do not see its front. We follow it and do not see its back. When we can lay hold of the Tao of old to direct the things of the present day and are able to know it as it was of old in the beginning, this is called unwinding the clue of Tao. The skillful masters of the Tao in old times, with a subtle and exquisite penetration, comprehended its mysteries and were deep also, so as to elude men's knowledge. As they were thus beyond men's knowledge, I will make an effort to describe of what sort they appeared to be. Shrinking looked they like those who wade through a stream in winter, irresolute like those who are afraid of all around them, grave like a guest in awe of his host evanescent like ice that is melting away, unpretentious like wood that has not been fashioned into anything, vacant like a valley 
and dull like muddy water. Who can make the muddy water clear? Let it be still and it will gradually become clear. Who can secure the condition of rest? Let movement go on and the condition of rest will gradually arise. They who preserve this method of the Tao do not wish to be full of themselves. It is through their not being full of themselves that they can afford to seem worn and not appear new and complete. The state of vacancy should be brought to the utmost degree, and that of stillness guarded with unwearying vigor. All things alike go through their processes of activity, and then we see them return to their original state. When things in the vegetable world have displayed their luxuriant growth, we see each of them return to its root. This returning to their root is what we call the state of stillness, and that stillness may be called a reporting that they have fulfilled their appointed end. The report of that fulfillment is the regular unchanging rule. To know that unchanging rule is to be intelligent. Not to know it leads to wild movements and evil issues. The knowledge of that unchanging rule produces a grand capacity and forbearance, and that capacity and forbearance lead to a community of feeling with all things. From this community of feeling comes a kingliness of character, and he who is king-like goes on to be heaven-like. In that likeness to heaven, he possesses the Tao. Possessed of the Tao, he endures long, and to the end of his bodily life is exempt from all danger of decay. In the highest antiquity, the people did not know that there were their rulers. In the next age, they loved them and praised them. In the next, they feared them. In the next, they despised them. Thus it was that when faith in the Tao was deficient in the rulers, a want of faith in them ensued in the people. How irresolute did those earliest rulers appear, showing by their reticence the importance which they set upon their words. Their work was done and their undertakings were successful, while the people all said, We are as we are of ourselves. When the great Tao way or method ceased to be observed, benevolence and righteousness came into vogue. Then appeared wisdom and shrewdness, and there ensued great hypocrisy. When harmony no longer prevailed throughout the six kinships, filial sons found their manifestation. When the states and clans fell into disorder, loyal ministers appeared. If we could renounce our sageness and discard our wisdom, it would be better for the people a hundredfold if we could renounce our benevolence and discard our righteousness. The people would again become filial and kindly. If we could renounce our artful contrivances and discard our scheming for gain, there would be no thieves nor robbers. Those three methods of government thought olden ways in elegance did fail, and made these names their want of worth to veil. But simple views and courses plain and true would selfish ends and many lusts eschew. When we renounce learning, we have no troubles. The ready yes and flattering yea, small is the difference they display but mark their issues good and ill. What space the gulf between shall fill? What all men fear is indeed to be feared. But how wide and without end is the range of questions asking to be discussed? The multitude of men look satisfied and pleased, as if enjoying a full banquet, as if mounted on a tower in spring, I alone seem listless and still, 
my desires having as yet given no indication of their presence. I am like an infant which has not yet smiled. I look dejected and forlorn, as if I had no home to go to. The multitude of men all have enough and to spare. I alone seem to have lost everything. My mind is that of a stupid man. I am in a state of chaos. Ordinary men look bright and intelligent, while I alone seem to be benighted. They look full of discrimination, while I alone am dull and confused. I seem to be carried about as on the sea, drifting as if I had nowhere to rest. All men have their spheres of action, while I alone seem dull and incapable, like a rude borderer. Thus I alone am different from other men, but I value the nursing mother, the Tao. The grandest forms of active force from Tao come, their only source. Who can of Tao the nature tell? Our sight it flies, our touch as well. Eluding sight, eluding touch. The forms of all things are in its crouch. Eluding touch, eluding sight. There are their semblances all right. Profound it is, dark and obscure. Things, essences, all there endure. Those essences the truth enfold. Of what when seen shall then be told. Now it is so, twas so of old. Its name what passes not away. So, in their beautiful array, things form and never know decay. How know I that it is so with all the beauties of existing things? By this nature of the Tao, the partial becomes complete, the crooked straight, the empty full, the worn out new. He whose desires are few gets them. He whose desires are many goes astray. Therefore the sage holds in his embrace the one thing of humility and manifests it to all the world. He is free from self-display and therefore he shines, from self-assertion and therefore he is distinguished, from self-boasting and therefore his merit is acknowledged from self-complacency, and therefore he acquires superiority. It is because he is thus free from striving that therefore no one in the world is able to strive with him. That saying of the ancients, that the partial becomes complete, was not vainly spoken. All real completion is comprehended under it. Abstaining from speech marks him who is obeying the spontaneity of his nature. A violent wind does not last for a whole morning. A sudden rain does not last for the whole day. To whom is it that these two things are owing? To heaven and earth. If heaven and earth cannot make such spasmodic actings last long, how much less can man? Therefore, when one is making the Tao his business, those who are also pursuing it agree with him in it, and those who are making the manifestation of its course their object agree with him in that, while even those who are failing in both these things agree with him where they fail. Hence, those with whom he agrees as to the Tao have the happiness of attaining to it, those with whom he agrees as to its manifestation have the happiness of attaining to it, and those with whom he agrees in their failure have also the happiness of attaining to the Tao. But when there is not faith sufficient on his part, a want of faith in him ensues on the part of the others. He who stands on his tiptoes does not stand firm. He who stretches his legs does not walk easily, so he who displays himself does not shine. He who asserts his own views is not distinguished. He 
He who vaunts himself does not find his merit acknowledged. He who is self-conceited has no superiority allowed to him. Such conditions, viewed from the standpoint of the Tao, are like remnants of food, or a tumor on the body which all dislike. Hence those who pursue the course of the Tao do not adopt or allow them. There was something undefined and complete coming into existence before heaven and earth. How still it was and formless, standing alone and undergoing no change, reaching everywhere and in no danger of being exhausted. It may be regarded as the mother of all things. I do not know its name, and I give it the designation of the Tao, the way or course. Making an effort further to give it a name, I call it the Great. Great, it passes on in constant flow. Passing on, it becomes remote. Having become remote, it returns. Therefore, the Tao is great. Heaven is great. Earth is great. And the Sage King is also great. In the universe, there are four that are great, and the Sage King is one of them. Man takes his law from the earth. The earth takes its law from heaven. Heaven takes its law from the Tao. The law of the Tao is its being what it is. Gravity is the root of lightness, stillness the ruler of movement. Therefore, a wise prince, marching the whole day, does not go far from his baggage wagons. Although he may have brilliant prospects to look at, he quietly remains in his proper place, indifferent to them. How should the lord of a myriad chariots carry himself lightly before the kingdom? If he do act lightly, he has lost his root of gravity. If he proceed to active movement, he will lose his throne. The skillful traveler leaves no traces of his wheels or footsteps. The skillful speaker says nothing that could be found fault with or blamed. The skillful reckoner uses no tallies. The skillful closer needs no bolts or bars, while to open what he has shut will be impossible. The skillful binder uses no strings or knots, while to unloose what he has bound will be impossible. In the same way, the sage is always skillful at saving men, and so he does not cast away any man. He is always skillful at saving things, and so he does not cast away anything. This is called hiding the light of his procedure. Therefore, the man of skill is a master to be looked up to by him who has not the skill, and he who has not the skill is the helper of the reputation of him who has the skill. If the one did not honor his master, and the other did not rejoice in his helper, an observer, though intelligent, might greatly err about them. This is called the utmost degree of mystery. Who knows his manhood's strength, yet still his female feebleness maintains? As to one channel flow the many drains, all come to him, yea, all beneath the sky. Thus he the constant excellence retains, the simple child again, free from all stains. Who knows how white attracts? yet always keeps himself within black shade. The pattern of humility displayed, displayed in view of all beneath the sky, he in the unchanging excellence arrayed, endless return to man's first state has made. Who knows how glory shines, yet loves disgrace, nor e'er for it is pale, behold his presence in a spacious veil to which men come from all beneath the sky. The unchanging excellence completes its tale, 
the simple infant man in him we hail. The unwrought material, when divided and distributed, forms vessels. The sage, when employed, becomes the head of all the officers of government, and in his greatest regulations he employs no violent measures. If anyone should wish to get the kingdom for himself, and to effect this by what he does, I see that he will not succeed. The kingdom is a spirit-like thing, and cannot be got by active doing. He who would so win it destroys it. He who would hold it in his grasp loses it. The course and nature of things is such that what was in front is now behind. What warmed anon we freezing find. Strength is of weakness oft the spoil. The store in ruins mocks our toil. Hence the sage puts away excessive effort, extravagance, and easy indulgence. He who would assist a lord of men in harmony with the Tao will not assert his mastery in the kingdom by force of arms. Such a course is sure to meet with its proper return. Wherever a host is stationed, briars and thorns spring up. In the sequence of great armies, there are sure to be bad years. A skillful commander strikes a decisive blow and stops. He does not dare, by continuing his operations, to assert and complete his mastery. He will strike the blow, but will be on his guard against being vain or boastful or arrogant in consequence of it. He strikes it as a matter of necessity. He strikes it but not from a wish for mastery. When things have attained their strong maturity, they become old. This may be said to be not in accordance with the Tao, and what is not in accordance with it soon comes to an end. Now arms, however beautiful, are instruments of evil omen, hateful, it may be said, to all creatures. Therefore, they who have the Tao do not like to employ them. The superior man ordinarily considers the left hand the most honorable place, but in time of war, the right hand. Though sharp weapons are instruments of evil omen, and not the instruments of the superior man, he uses them only on the compulsion of necessity. Calm and repose are what he prizes. Victory by force of arms is to him undesirable. To consider this desirable would be to delight in the slaughter of men, and he who delights in the slaughter of men cannot get his will in the kingdom. On occasions of festivity, to be on the left hand is the prized position, on occasions of mourning, the right. The second in command of the army has his place on the left, the general commanding-in-chief has his on the right. His place, that is, is assigned to him as in the rites of mourning. He who has killed multitudes of men should weep for them with the bitterest grief, and the victor in battle has his place rightly according to those rites. The Tao, considered as unchanging, has no name. Though in its primordial simplicity it may be small, the whole world dares not deal with one embodying it as a minister. If a feudal prince or the king could guard and hold it, all would spontaneously submit themselves to him. Heaven and earth, under its guidance, unite together and send down the sweet dew, which, without the directions of men, reaches equally everywhere as of its own accord. As soon as it proceeds to action, it has a name. When it once has that name, men can know to rest in it. When they know to rest in it, they can be free from all risk of failure and error. The relation of the Tao to all the world is like that of the great rivers and seas to the streams from the valleys. 
He who knows other men is discerning. He who knows himself is intelligent. He who overcomes others is strong. He who overcomes himself is mighty. He who is satisfied with his lot is rich. He who goes on acting with energy has a firm will. He who does not fail in the requirements of his position continues long. He who dies and yet does not perish has longevity. All pervading is the great Tao. It may be found on the left hand and on the right. All things depend on it for their production, which it gives to them, not one refusing obedience to it. When its work is accomplished, it does not claim the name of having done it. It clothes all things as with a garment, and makes no assumption of being their lord. All things return to their root and disappear, and do not know that it is it which presides over their doing so. It may be named in the greatest things. Hence the sage is able in the same way to accomplish his great achievements. It is through his not making himself great that he can accomplish them. To him who holds in his hands the great image of the invisible Tao, the whole world repairs. Men resort to him and receive no hurt, but find rest, peace, and the feeling of ease. Music and dainties will make the passing guests stop for a time. But though the Tao, as it comes from the mouth, seems insipid and has no flavor, though it seems not worth being looked at or listened to, the use of it is inexhaustible. When one is about to take an inspiration, he is sure to make a previous expiration. When he is going to weaken another, he will first strengthen him. When he is going to overthrow another, he will first have raised him up. When he is going to despoil another, he will first have made gifts to him. This is called hiding the light of his procedure. The soft overcomes the hard, and the weak the strong. Fishes should not be taken from the deep. Instruments for the profit of a state should not be shown to the people. The Tao, in its regular course, does nothing for the sake of doing it, and so there is nothing which it does not do. If princes and kings were able to maintain it, all things would of themselves be transformed by them. If this transformation became to me an object of desire, I would express the desire by the nameless simplicity. Simplicity without a name is free from all external aim, with no desire at rest and still, all things go right as of their will. And with that, we've reached the end of part one of the Tao Te Ching, or the Tao and its characteristics, by Lao Tzu. I'm not quite sure what I just read. I'm going to have to think about this one a little longer. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, you'll find a link to it on our Goodreads page, where we keep a library of everything read on this podcast. Just go to goodreads.com slash boringbooksforbedtime. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at Boring Books Pod. I'd love to hear what you thought about this one. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Until our next boring book, good night.